Another episode of the Gracious Guest Show, the Gracious Guest Podcast, and I am your humble host of the Gracious Guest Show, Mike Creevy. And you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something a little different today, insofar as it's not very common for me to do uh, two movie reviews or, or suggestions or recommendations back to back. But it's also not common for me to have, like, weeks and weeks in between episodes, for that matter. So uh, I'm recording this right now on January the 18th of 2018. And, of course, the last episode was episode uh, 40, I believe. Yeah. Are we, are we there already? I think so. Um, now i got to double-check that. I think it was 40. Uh, at any rate, um, you know, it was it was just a really, really busy time, obviously, because of the holidays, um, with you know, Christmas and New Year's and everything, and then um, as great as that was, then with teaching the high school, you know, you, you know, when you come back from break, it's very busy, obviously, as everybody just kind of gets back to uh, business as usual at the school. So, uh, so it's been a little while that uh, I haven't been able to, to really get a podcast together in the, uh, in the meantime, so... Um, I'm a little rusty, I guess, and really wanted to uh, get back and do this. I was also working on some some uh, some stuff for the other show that uh, I I host called the Ever Ancient Ever New Show, which is a more topical kind of um, you know sort of youth and young adult ministry themed kind of show. So I was trying to catch up on that a little bit too. But anyway, uh, I, I wanted to uh, jump back in here today without missing a beat. So I double checked here. By the way, it was episode 40. You guys knew that. I kind of drew a blank. I can't believe it's been 40 episodes already and that this is uh, number 41. So today, as you've no doubt seen, uh, I want to just talk just for a couple minutes. This isn't going to be nearly as long as the Star Wars review was. um, But I just want to recommend a movie that's been on my mind. I don't know why this was on my mind lately. It might be... Uh, because it's the it's basically going to be the 20th anniversary of when this film came out originally. Um, but I don't know, may, that, that might be part of it, but I'm sure there's probably more to it. But the movie is The Thin Red Line, the uh, 1998 uh, Terrence Malick film. And um, I'm not a, a, a huge film expert or anything, but, but I'm a film enthusiast, I suppose. Might be a good way of putting it, uh, an amateur kind of wannabe film uh, film buff. So, uh, you know, to be a buff or to be buff, you need to work out, right? So I, you know, you, you become a film buff by watching a lot of movies and paying attention to them and reading about them and digging into them. So, I mean, I'm doing that, uh, but I wouldn't call myself a, a film buff just yet. So uh, at any rate, this movie, uh, it always intrigued me. And I've seen it a number of times over the years. And it just was, you know, something I was thinking about again recently. I listened to the soundtrack an awful lot. And that's... Uh, um, if you want to hear a little bit more about that, consult an earlier episode of this show, the um, uh, my my top ten favorite Hans Zimmer uh, film scores. Hans Zimmer is my favorite film composer, and he did the score for The Thin Red Line, and I, I talk about that I think a little bit during that episode. Um, but you know, that being said, like the the music, I mean, I'm not sitting there when I listen to it thinking about the movie per se. I just think it's a great soundtrack. Um, but you know, it was like I said, it was on my mind and. Um, I looked into it a little bit, you know, read up on it, and um, you know, got a little of the background. But I uh, uh, just wanted to mention some of that as, as sort of the, the backdrop for the reason I'm recommending it. So this movie, if you're not familiar with it, it's uh, it, as I said, it came out in the uh, late summer, I believe, of 1998. And I I've always thought I, overall it's been pretty well received. It's gotten good reviews over the years. I seem to remember though that when it came out which was um, the summer right before I went into high school, actually. Um, that was the same summer that uh, Saving Private Ryan had come out during. So at the beginning of that summer, you have this iconic you know, World War II movie come out that had been pitched you know, and sort of like um, uh, really teased a lot, and, and there was all this, this promotion for it and all this, this um, building up of anticipation for Steven Spielberg's you know, visionary World War II movie to come out. And it was such a huge success. And it really was, you know, just 
you know, broke all sorts of box office records and got all this discussion and it came out around Memorial Day. And, you know, so like a lot of that summer, I still remember, like there was a lot of commentary, a lot of people thinking about Saving Private Ryan. So it just, it was in the shadow, I think, in some ways of that and all of that fervor and, and, you know, the idea of uh, a more realistic sort of uh, gritty kind of World War II movie, a new era of that kind of movie that The Thin Red Line came out later that summer. And I think a lot of people, maybe myself included, when you saw some of the trailers for it uh, and the promotional stuff for The Thin Red Line, might have thought going into it, hey, you know, oh, this is great. This is going to be like the Pacific Theater version of, you know, Saving Private Ryan, which was all about D-Day and the European front. Well, nothing could be further from the truth, I mean, in that sense. And they're, they're, as it turns out, Saving Private Ryan, Thin Red Line, both phenomenal films are among my favorites, but radically different. Radically different in style, in scope, in purpose, uh, in pacing. Um, and they cover a lot of the same themes, sure, but but I just think, you know you got to try to see this movie on its own and, and forget about maybe other World War II movies or definitely try to forget about comparing it to other movies and just sort of take it as it is. So the, the movie itself is is based on, and, and as I understand it, it's, it's made, made quite a few changes, but it's based on a book of the same name by James Jones, uh, the American novelist who wrote um, books like From Here to Eternity that was you know won huge awards and, and was instantly made into a, a really classic World War II film back in the 50s. So like right on the, the the coattails of World War II, like right at that time, James Jones himself was um, a, uh, a veteran um, and that, you know, he started writing after World War II. And, and that was, you know, he had a couple attempts at writing, you know, some, some books and some stuff that people shot down. But when he released From Here to Eternity in 1951, it was his first published novel. It was just, you know, critically acclaimed and got all this, this attention. Uh, and then he released a second book, which is sometimes considered the second in a, a trilogy, in a sense, the last of which is a book called The Whistle uh, that was uh, written and uh, published posthumously. With um, he, he knew he was dying at the time and left extensive notes for a friend of his to finish it. So it's it still retains a lot of his his uh, style and everything and his, his um, goals with it. And that book was published in 1978. But The Thin Red Line came out in 1962. You know, so he had a lot of years between these three books. And The Thin Red Line uh, got a lot of attention when it came out, and then it was made into a film in, I think, 1964, but I don't know how popular that was or how many people knew about it. It, it never compared, obviously, to the, the fame, I don't think, of, of From Here to Eternity. Um, but at any rate, Jones's book was is a, is a fictionalization of a real battle that he was part of, um, namely the Battle of Mount Austin, the Galloping Horse, and the Seahorse, um, the, the, the name for these, these hills or these positions uh, that they had named at the time. But it was in the Guadalcanal campaign from uh, December to uh, January 1940, well, December 1942 into January 1943. And, uh, you know, vicious battle, very important campaign in World War II in the Pacific Theater, and that's the setting for this movie, for the book and for this movie. And Jones himself was part of that, as I mentioned. So it, it's this book and then the movie is meant to be a very kind of profound, deep reflection on a lot of things. OK, war, it's, it's like the war, the battle is the context for these much deeper, eternal human questions. So that's the first thing is, is I would say it's um, there's a there's an old uh, movie. um actually came out around the same time called Bowfinger with Steve Martin and Eddie Murphy. And it's, it's a comedy. And at one point, Eddie Murphy's character is yelling at his, his agent. He, he's playing an actor and he, he's yelling at his agent, you know, that the script he's reading is, is, you know, not good. It's too cerebral. The audience has to think about it too much. He goes, we're trying to make a movie, not a film. And it's like, so I use that analogy sometimes. So in this case, I would say the thin red line, it's a film, you know, not, not a movie in that sense. Um, so it's it's almost three hours long. It's loaded with just long, prolonged shots sometimes that of just an actor's face, you know, and just like, and I know how boring this sounds, but I, I can't tell you enough. Like, there's just something about it. Like, you're you're kind of compelled to enter into 
and, and not be able to quickly escape from through some gimmick or from uh, some, as, as Bishop Barron, who I'm a big fan of, calls it some whiz-bang CGI sequence or something. There's none of that, really. There, there's plenty of battle. There's some, some real graphic stuff. It's, it's a war movie. You know, there's, there's language. It's, it's not for kids, you know, so it's, it, it's rated R. But, uh, but throughout it, it's very clear that those things aren't the focal point. You know, it's not just violence for violence's sake. That whole world, that whole battle, it, it, it raises all these questions. The characters have a lot of monologues. You know, so you'll just see beauty. And the, the, the cinematography of it's beautiful. The music's beautiful. The cinematography's beautiful. And you have all these sustained shots. And they filmed a lot of it on location in the Solomon Islands, you know, near where these, these battles, this battle actually took place. So it's pretty accurate, you know, to the, the terrain and everything. So you see all the landscape and you see a lot of shots of animals. And there's this constant motif of, you know, the world beyond a war, you know, that the world still turns, um, in one sense, there's hope there, you know, uh, there's also a little bit of despair. There's a little bit of the, the, the pain of, you know, our wars, our fights, our human conflict doesn't just affect us, you know, it affects the, the, the earth itself. It, it, it does terrible injustice, you know, to creation. It, it, it rips up and destroys and chews up you know, the beauty of nature, including, uh, you know, the land and the animals. And, and this movie captures moments like that. You know, you see a scene where all these guys are getting blown up and running and, and there's, you know, it's like a war movie scene. And then it'll just cut over for like 30 seconds of like this little bird just kind of climbing and, and with a broken wing and like it's been hurt. And so, you know, it's not forced, it's not preachy, but that theme runs throughout the whole movie. And I can't even begin to describe it to you, you just have to kind of see it. So that's there, you know, and another thing that's there, I think, is uh, one of the, the, the log lines in the movie on, on like the box or if you look at the poster is um, every man fights his own war. Um, and so that's a theme here, too, that, OK, yeah, it's World War Two. It's you know, Americans fighting the Japanese on Guadalcanal, you know, OK, but there's a deeper war going on. And that's a huge theme the whole way throughout it. Um you know, what is war? Where does this war come from? Like people reaching out to God, some people rejecting God, some people uh, finding hope in the middle of this horrendous hell they're going through. Others who just can't seem to find hope. One of the big recurring themes between two of the characters, and I won't give any real spoilers that would ruin it in any meaningful way, but two of the characters played by Sean Penn and uh, Jim Caviezel, a phenomenal performance between the two of them, uh, is this recurring theme of, of the spark. And Jim Caviezel's character, you know, he's not perfect, but he's a very just sort of what you see is what you get, kind of like he has hope, you know, he's 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 a good guy, he doesn't do everything perfect, you know, but he, he believes, he just has this sense that there's more, you know, that there's a spark. And he's not running around like Bible thumping or anything, but, but his sergeant, played by Sean Penn, is just burnout, jaded, you know, he doesn't believe there's any, he's very clear, there's nothing besides this nasty, you know, awful, you know, god-awful world that's just chewing itself up and spitting it out and, as he says, blowing itself to hell as fast as anybody can arrange it. That's his kind of attitude, you know, and you can, t but the thing is, you can totally understand his perspective, you can appreciate it, because you're kind of brought into this. You're kind of brought to where they're at, and, and all the suffering they're going through, friends dying, and then these these long shots of just after a battle, like one of them, and the, I can't tell you enough, like the acting, it's not just great, you know, lines, great, great dialogue. There'll, there'll be like two minute scenes where it's just a character just looking at like the aftermath of a battle. And somehow like these guys, like the way they, like what they do with their faces, you know, like it's not just, oh, I'm turning on the waterworks, I'm acting out tears. These guys like body language, facial expressions, angle of eyebrows, you know, like the 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 acting is so phenomenal all throughout this movie, with scene after scene like this in, in many different ways, where you can feel what they're feeling. You know, you can see oh, this character who is so hard hearted or just so hard nosed, just this really tough guy, and then off to the side, even he breaks down, or another guy who seemed weak, who actually, when it's push comes to shove, he finds courage that you didn't expect. Um, so, why am I bringing this movie up? you know, on this particular show, it's because I think, you know, my old, my focal point here, my, my attempt always with the Gracious Guest Show to think about wonder, the marvelous, the world beyond, the things that we can't put into words, that experience of the other, 
that, that goes beyond what I can see and touch. Um, this transcendence, you know, uh, that is all over the place in uh, the in the thin red lines. Fingerprints are all over it from beginning to end. And I just want to close, you know, start to bring it to a close here with um, um, this is you know something I found online that just kind of gave this uh, about the title because a lot of times people uh, might think that the title appears to be from um, apparently Rudley Kipling or Rudyard Kipling's poem Tommy. I'm getting this off Wikipedia by the way. <laughs> Wikipedia is great. Um, in one of his books, uh, he writes, uh, uh, where is it here? The idea of the soldiers, you know, in a battle being the, quote, thin red line of heroes. Um, but that, evidently, the title itself actually comes from within Jones's book, which says at one point in the original novel, The Thin Red Line, he said, they discover the thin red line that divides the sane from the mad and the living from the dead. And that is, I think, a very appropriate title because that is, it's like a razor, like the whole way through the movie, like you're, you're kind of walking this tightrope as you watch it because the whole movie from beginning to end, you're on that line between life and death. You're with them going through this. And that's the same line that is his argument, Jones's argument, the line between sanity and complete madness. And you see that. You see some people fall off at one way or the other, or some people choose a side somehow. You know, this character, they've all been through the same hell, but some of them find peace and sanity in the midst of it somehow, you know, mysteriously. Others find nothing but madness and death and hopelessness. And so it really, I think at the end of the movie, it really brings up a lot of great questions, a lot more than even the ones I went over here today on the show. Uh, and I really encourage you, obviously, you know, if, if you're, uh, I'd say if, you know, if you're under 17 or so, you know, like with, with, uh, R ratings and stuff like that, you know, like be aware of that, you know, there's, there's some very, um, there's, you know, some, some language throughout. There's, uh, some, some war violence. Um, you know, it's compared to some other war movies I've seen, it's nowhere near as graphic as some of them are, especially today. Uh, or as like, you know, as graphic as horror films and stuff like that, that are just kind of about that. Um, but this is a, a phenomenal, phenomenal film from 1998, the thin red line, uh, by, uh, somewhat eclectic, but very, very, uh, renowned um, uh, screenwriter and film producer and, and director Terrence Malick. In fact, this marked his return to film after like a 20-year hiatus where he was working on other stuff. So it was a big thing that drew a lot of A-list celebrities. Uh, so the cast has sometimes some surprising faces. They might only be in it for like a minute or two. Uh, there were people who... Um, uh, wanted to be uh, wanted to be in it. Bruce Willis apparently, you know, offered to like pay like first class plane tickets for like all these people if he could be in it, but it didn't work out. But it's got Sean Penn, Jim Caviezel, uh, John Cusack, Woody Harrelson, uh, Nick Nolte, among others. John Travolta has a little role, so some faces you'll recognize. Um, and I highly recommend that you definitely check it out and just you know pay attention maybe to some of those questions it might raise for you. So the Thin Red Line, check it out when you get a chance. I'm Mike Creevy. Couldn't be happier that you joined me today on The Gracious Guest Show. It won't be three or four weeks till I make another one of these podcasts, so stand, uh, stand by, stay tuned. And uh, as always, spread the word about the show. Tell your friends about it if you enjoy it. They can subscribe over at iTunes or Poc uh, Pocket Casts. Uh, I host the site through Podbean. Go to my website, also thegraciousguest.org, for more podcast information, my blog, uh, presentations that I offer. I can come and, and give at your parish or your event or whatever that might be. Thank you very much for, uh, for checking out the show. And until next time, don't forget to wonder. Take care.